So I've got uh, time is about 4.57. I'm going to go ahead and start about three minutes early. Just that'll give me a little bit of time to just do the little quick intro part. So yes, this is a one hour webinar that is a sort of a part pared down uh, content from my on-demand course called Asphalt Shingles in the Code based on the 2021 IRC. And I won't be able to, obviously, in 60 minutes, we're not going to be able to talk about every code provision for asphalt shingles. So what I did is I looked at my complete class and thought, all right, this is a most likely a home inspector crowd here. And so I picked out the things that, A, I felt like were most useful probably to home inspectors, where you're coming in to see something that's already built. Possibly you're doing new construction work, but most likely it's pre-purchase home inspections. That's where the business is. And so who knows what year these homes were built, you're probably not gonna be able to evaluate things like underlayment very well. So I picked out things that I think are gonna be easier and more relevant to looking at an existing roof system. And then also just the things that I thought might be, um, might be less obvious things, things that I came across in my years as a building inspector that it seemed like were less common knowledge to folks. So that's kind of how I went about picking out how to fill this 60 minutes. And this is a brand new 60 minute fill. So I have no idea how much of this I will actually make it through, but I definitely won't be finishing early. So uh, anyway, my name is Glenn Matthewson. This is just sort of a collage slide that I bring up at the beginning of all of my classes. And um, it's just, you know, sort of a sampling of my career, if you will, in construction. And I'll just mention a few of the highlights and the things I guess I'm most proud of. Uh, I started in construction at the age 19 as a laborer. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. I think I started about as low on the totem pole as you could possibly start. Uh, moved on to become a framer, framed a few homes in the late 90s. And then I started my own uh, custom deck design and construction company and did really high-end decks, did basement finishes, some minor remodels, uh, but mostly really focused on high-end decks here in the Denver, Colorado area. In uh, 2005, I became a building inspector and plan reviewer for the city of Westminster, Colorado, a code inspector, a government inspector, a new construction inspector, not a home inspector. So I have no experience as a home inspector. I don't pretend to be a home inspector. Uh, we have different careers, code inspectors and home inspectors, but a lot of what we do crosses paths. And hopefully both those careers are folks that are very interested and excited in construction practices and helping folks understand what maybe went wrong, what maybe should have been done, and maybe some guidance on how to repair some things. And just like code inspectors, home inspectors have all kinds of different styles and opinions and characters and limits to how they perform their work. Uh, so anyway, 2005, building inspector plan reviewer and did that until 2018 when I left the city to let my side gig become my full-time job. And my side gig was writing and speaking and teaching and consulting in building codes. Uh, so I started buildingcodecollege.com back in 2015, 2012 really, 2015 is when I really started putting more effort into it and trying to basically clone myself and uh, make my education available, not just in person during a failed inspection, right? And then I got my master code professional certification. I attend the code hearings because I, I know that the code is just created by people and I can be one of those people. I have an opinion to share. So I go to the hearings and share. I've been doing that for about the last 10 years. And I was awarded educator of the year by ICC 2021, right for fine home building, blah, blah, blah. You can learn more about me if you want to go, go into the instructors tab at buildingcodecollege.com or glennmatthewson.com. Uh, briefly, I'll just mention this about buildingcodecollege.com because it's kind of my consolation prize to you guys. I have no idea how much of the content I have prepared today that I'm actually going to get through. And what I don't do is rush to finish a class with all the content. I hate when I attend classes like that where the last 10 minutes are just flipping slides. So chances are I won't get through everything, but my consolation prize is this. You can go to buildingcodecollege.com, click on that on-demand course tab at the top, that's going to bring you to the on-demand course catalog. And if you scroll down, 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 you'll see this course based on the 2018 IRC, which 
not a ton of changes between 18 and 21. Um, but that's a on-demand course, um, ICC approved. If any of you guys have ICC certifications that you need CEUs, and you can use this coupon code ASPHALT, and you can get uh, access to this on-demand course completely free. So that way you can catch, catch the subjects that I didn't talk about today, or if there's something I talked about today that you want a refresher on, you want to see it again, uh, you can go sign up for this class for free and you get three months of access to the videos and there's practice quiz questions, et cetera. Uh, that's kind of also my consolation prize in that I don't give out slide packets or my slide deck for my presentation because slides are a visual aid, not a handout. So you get a, access to my online visual aid, if you will. All right. So with that, uh, let's get going. The first session of the on-demand course is just general asphalt provisions. And I basically skipped that and we're gonna jump into the some content from the second session, which is about shingles and underlayment. And there's a very specific thing here I wanna talk about uh, is about the roof sheathing. Now, of course, I mentioned I'm going to talk about the things that are most likely to be visible to an inspector, and then I bring up roof sheathing as the first one. So you might think I'm, it's it's a five o'clock, it's an afternoon webinar, maybe I already started hitting the sauce or something. But the reason I'm picking this one up, and I'm going to talk about this briefly, is for two reasons. People get all across the board, from home inspectors to roofing contractors to government code inspectors, there are so many people that do not understand something about solidly sheathed decks and some of the history with skip sheathing or spaced sheathing. And then I'm also talking about this because there is a change coming in the 2024 IRC that will hopefully, hopefully help alleviate some of the miscommunication about this. So this is a provision that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, again, from roofers to government inspectors to home inspectors, asphalt shingles. And we have this subsection about sheathing requirements. And it says asphalt shingles shall be fastened to solidly sheathed decks. And what you see right here is a solidly sheathed deck using wood structural panel sheathing. And you can see even the little clips there. Those clips have a different story for edge support, but they also provide small gapping between the sheet panels for expansion and contraction. So yes, we see OSB sheathing that's likely installed with a little bit of sloppiness, a little bit of gapping, because that's the real world of construction. We don't pour this stuff into an injection mold, like making something out of plastic. And here's another example of solidly sheathed decks. And this is the point where a lot of folks are going, oh, that's not a solidly sheathed deck. That's lumber. That's spaced sheathing. That's gapped sheathing. You have to reskin this or you have to lay over top of it wood structural panel sheathing in order to install new asphalt shingles. But that's the misunderstanding. So here we have solid lumber sheathing. And I can build a house today in 2023 using the 2021 IRC. And I can go to section 803 and the very first section is lumber sheathing. And it gives me guidance for the thickness and the maximum spans for using lumber sheathing. So why would we have to skin over lumber sheathing with wood structural panels just because it's an old method of construction if it's still in the IRC today? Now, if we look at this roof from underneath, here we see spaced lumber sheathing. Also in the past, it was referred to as skip sheathing and probably some other slang terms for it. And again, in this example, you can see looking through the slats of this spaced sheathing, you can see wood structural panel sheathing laid over top of it. And in this example, if that's for an asphalt shingle installation, that, that would be required to lay over solid sheathing over top of spaced lumber sheathing. And we can go right back to that same section in the most modern 2021 IRC, and we see guidance for using spaced lumber sheathing, and that's for wood shake or shake roofing, um, which is not gonna be part of this class today. But this is just showing these examples that in the current code, we have wood structural panel sheathing, lumber sheathing, and then you have spaced lumber sheathing. And so that's what throws folks off all the time when they see this statement about 
shingles have to be fastened to solidly sheathed decks. Somehow solidly sheathed gets interpreted by folks to simply mean wood structural panels. Now, let's just real quickly not beat around the bush on this. One of the reasons this happens is because a lot of roof shingle replacement jobs are paid for through insurance claims. And if it's paid for through an insurance claim, it feels like the general public as well as the contractors look at that as kind of like, yeah, I won the lottery. And now we can push those dollars high because insurance is paying. So a lot of times this gets derived, this all starts from the misunderstanding of the roofing contractor in interpreting the code. And hey, if they can get the insurance company to pay for reskinning the deck, they can have the opportunity to make more labor. It was really interesting in my time as a building inspector is when we had hailstorms that would come through and just wipe out neighborhoods and the work was plentiful. We never got questions from roofers about do we require the layover and can we get a letter saying we require it so they can pinch a little more money from the insurance because the money was in just replacing thousands of roofs. But when it wasn't a hailstorm season and, and work was not quite as plentiful, it was odd. There was a correlation over 12 years as a government inspector that that's suddenly when all these requests came out for us to mandate this, which my jurisdiction was studied and understood the provisions. And this was not something we had any authority to require. Um, so anyway, some of you that are disagreeing with me at this moment, I'm sure that there are some of you are, but let me show you that I already prompted this. There was a wide open, transparent discussion for all interested parties on this exact subject in the creation of the 2024 IRC. Here was a proposal put forth for the 2024. It was approved unanimously. And you see here, RB254 was the proposal. And look at all of these section numbers that had to be changed in order to clean this up and clarify the language so it can be more consistently interpreted. I don't know who this weirdo guy is who thought you know, that he should prompt this discussion at the hearings, but he put the work in representing himself and got this discussion going. Now, one of these changes was simply getting terminology correct. We have a defined term in the IRC for roof deck, but all through the code, Things like roof, roofing, roof surfaces. There was a lot of inconsistency in the language. So one of the proposals was just to clean up the language and use the defined term. But the other part of this proposal was fixing this language about solid sheathing and what that meant. So you can see in the big text here, the 2021, fastened to solidly sheathed decks. And the change is shown up top. There's that same section number. The underline represents what should be added and the strike out what would be struck out. And so that section would be changed to say asphalt shingles shall be fastened to wood structural panels or solid lumber sheathing. And you can see as another, another example that's not asphalt, these are all the different sections plus more that apply to all the different shingles where I cleaned up this language to be consistent. But we can see here where for wood shingles, we get all three, wood structural panels, solid lumber sheathing, or spaced lumber sheathing. And this is what a lot of code changes are, guys. A lot of them are not super glamorous. They're not like more restrictions or more products or new technologies. A lot of good code changes and modifications that get made in future editions is just simple cleanup of the language so that we can all read it and come out with the same interpretation. So all of the shingle manufacturers were there, the representatives of the asphalt shingle organizations, asphalt shingle contractors, anyone and everyone involved with shingles was there and this was all discussed. So if you have a disagreement, show up to the code hearings, uh, but hopefully this will help some things get cleaned up in the future. Okay, moving along, took a little more time on that subject than I wanted to. Oh, but I'm still doing good for time, maybe since we got a little early start. And uh, so again, the message there, guys, if I didn't make it clear, anybody can write a proposal to change the code. There's no cost. You can do it from home. And then once you set your proposal in, it's not yours anymore. Anyone and everyone can come in and make changes and modifications to it. 
uh, there actually was someone that had some slight modifications to my original proposal. And that's the beauty of how the I-code process works. I know you home inspectors see so many things years after it's been built, after the code thought that it had it right, and you see the result of what happened so many years later, I encourage you guys to share your experience, share your voice uh, in that code change process. All right, so I wanna talk very briefly about mansard roofs. Again, just one little subject of them that I saw come up in my time as an inspector that it seems didn't go so, people didn't quite completely understand. Uh, so here's, we got different names for roofs, mansard roofs, gambrelled roofs, um, lots of different kind of roof styles. I'm not getting into all that specifics. What I want to look at here is specifically the slope of the roof. For the IRC, the mansard roof is when the slope is more than 60 degrees. So that's more than a 2112 pitch. That's a that's a really steep roof. You're probably not going to be climbing on that one for inspection. I know I didn't as an inspector, but I would get the ladder up and I would look and investigate as close as I could in it. And so let's talk a little bit real quick about asphalt shingles and how they seal down for wind resistance. So here's some asphalt shingles laying flat along the horizon. And what do we have pulling these shingles together, squeezing these shingles against each other? It's the magical force of gravity, right? So gravity is pulling these shingles down to the substrate and ideally holding them together a little bit. And then what happens? We hope for a good warm day, a sunny day. This is why putting new roofs on in the winter time isn't always the best advice. We wait for a good sunny warm day to heat up and activate that sealant strip. And since the shingles are being held together from the force of gravity, when that sealant strip activates, it's in contact with the shingle below and it can seal and fuse the, the exposed edge, that final edge of the shingles together. All right, well, now let's look at it at the above 60 degree angle. And what's happened? We still have gravity pulling it down, but gravity isn't, isn't normal to the surface. It's not perpendicular to the surface anymore. So a lot less of that force of gravity is squeezing the shingles together. And a lot more of that force of gravity it's just pulling on the nails, essentially keeping the shingle, you know, from sliding off the roof. So in lack of having this additional force to keep those in contact, when the sun comes up, those shingles get warmed. What happens is these single shingles do not seal together. Now, this is where we have to get out of the code. Most of the real nitty gritty of a good roof shingle installation for asphalt shingles, those details are not in the IRC. They're really in the manufacturer's installation instructions. And the IRC states that shingles have to be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Now I'm bringing up some manufacturer's instructions. You could probably spot a manufacturer on here, but I always have to let everyone know the first time I bring up any type of manufactured products in any of my education, I simply chose these as an example. Our world is so full of information that is given to you, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the person giving the information or the people benefiting that person. And so it's another one of those times I just got to call a, call a cow a cow and say, this is how the world is. One thing that I have built my reputation on is I do not put any sponsored or promoted or anything like that into my education. Uh, I often do work with some manufacturers that will help support me to provide education, but they don't get to shape anything I put in my classes. Um, so that's just something I'm proud of as an independent educator. And I always wanna make sure people know that the examples I use are not because someone's trying to get, trying to market that in front of your face. All right, done with that disclaimer. So let's look at this example manufacturer. Remember. This is an example manufacturer. That means it may not be all manufacturers. So what I'm just showing you is something that I have seen in most of the manufacturer's instructions. And as you can see, see right here, for slopes exceeding 60 degrees, use a, apply immediately. It wants this down there immediately. As soon as you're installing it, a one inch diameter spot of asphalt roof cement under each shingle tab. And it's giving you the location, two inches up from the bottom edge, et cetera. And then here we have a picture showing the mansard or steep slope fastening pattern. And you can see four 
one inch spots of asphalt cement because the manufacturer knows they're not going to get sealed down due to that steep slope and what I just explained. But they still want the shingle to perform uh, within the wind zones and the wind speeds that they are promising the shingle will perform in. Now, for example, here's a different manufacturer. And if you notice, this manufacturer has six spots. They want six quarter size spots of asphalt plastic cement under each shingle. So one wants four, one wants six. What did I do when I was a building inspector? Well, I definitely didn't have access to the exact installation instructions for every roof I went to. I'm in Colorado. We do have a lot of hailstorms that wipe out roofs. We were typically always running months behind on our roof inspections. So no, as a government inspector, I couldn't get into the level of saying, well, this is X manufacturer. I, I'm going to look for four spots. And this is Y manufacturer. I'm going to look for six. And besides the fact these instructions are not meant for an inspector. The inspector is third party. That, that comes second. These instructions are meant for the professional installing it to do it right the first time. So simply as an inspector, all I did would be to tug on the bottom edge of some random samplings of mansard roof shingles. And if I'm able to lift it up, nothing was sealed. There's obviously a problem. And if I'm not able to lift it, then I stop right there and I don't know at whether they put dots or stripes or lines or how much sealant, but they did something and it's not pulling up and beyond any further inspection, I would be damaging the shingles. So good thing to remember with the steep slope shingles. And I will tell you as a building inspector, all I probably wrote this up every single mansard roof installation I ever came to. The installers simply in, in my 12 years experience, None of them were sealing these down. All right, we'll talk next about the starter course. Because uh, again, just something I see and saw go wrong so often. So starter course is not discussed in code. This is again, back to the manufacturer and how the shingle got manufactured. Because different shingles have different types of manufacturing styles. Where they put the sealant strip. Is it on the, is it on the top of the shingle below or is it on the bottom of the tab of the shingle above, like we see with three tab shingles. So, or it's with dimensional shingles. Um, so here's an example from a manufacturer. And in this example, they're saying, hey, you don't have to buy a special starter course. You could just put a full strip of shingles down there. This is for a dimensional shingle application where the sealant, the factory sealant adhesive is on top of the shingle. And they're saying, bring that shingle down so that adhesive is close to the edge and trim five and five eighths off of the front. So that now we have a factory sealant strip right at the front edge, at the eave edge there where the gutter is on the roof. And then here's a different manufacturer's example where they actually have a starter strip as a product that you purchase. And again, here they have the directions for putting that starter ship strip down, or you can take six inches off. It looks like they're telling you both options over here. So again, lots of choices these manufacturers will give. But the point is, this should not occur. What's happening here is a problem on half of this picture. So if you notice, if I look over here, this looks to be somewhat, at least from what we can see in an, in an, in an after the fact inspection, that this has been installed where that starter strip is down below and the sealant underneath those upper shingles is able to seal down to that shingle. But what happened right here? Well, right here, they didn't do the installation appropriately and they have one of those selvage films. I don't know if I even pronounced that right. This is a film that goes on the shingles um, during manufacturing. And it's so that when they're stacking the shingles up and wrapping them in the plastic, the starter strips, the, that adhesive you see right there, that black strip will be in contact with this sleeve, with this material that doesn't stick to it. So that obviously you don't want a pack of shingles and they're all stuck together. Sometimes they're sitting out in the sun. So here you can see they made an, an interesting mistake in that whatever they did in trying to put a starter course down, they actually put it in a manner that would ensure that this half did not seal down. And so if I'm able to lift that, what do you think wind can do, right? Wind can lift that. And once wind starts peeling shingles like that, you have a little leverage now. And so with that leverage, this is where you can 
start with one shingle lifting and often it can create a domino effect and peel the whole roof. So another example there where you see that starter strip not sealing to anything. Now, ideally that selvage film would not be there so that that sealant strip can seal down to the to the aggregate surface, the mineral surfacing on the shingle. And your starter strip would be fastened just above that sealant, close to the edge of the roof. So the starter strip is fastened down mechanically and can't lift. And then the, the first full course of shingles that goes on top, this piece will seal to this piece, which of course didn't occur due to this poor installation. Now you go to the manufacturer's instructions and it'll talk to you about fastener placement for your regular shingles here, six and an eighth inches up from the bottom edge of the shingle. Because when you're looking at that overall shingle, you're really putting the fasteners about midway on that shingle. But if you look up the example here of where you fasten the starter course, it's gotta be fastened in a different way. Starter course fastened between one and a half inches and three inches. Again, approximately where I'm showing those black dots down there. So as I mentioned, you get that mechanically fastened and then the upper part is sealed down with the factory adhesive. So if we look at this example, they almost had everything right on this, but again, it's a big red flag. If you can go to the bottom edge of the shingles and start lifting shingles up, you might not know exactly what went wrong, but you know something didn't go right. So in this example, we can look under here and we do see a starter strip and we do see the adhesive underneath that upper dimensional shingle, but they've overhung the shingle pretty far in this one. Manufacturers give you know, a certain amount of overhang that they generally want here, unless you're using a, like a D metal kind of flashing. There's, there's again, some nuance and some details in that, but that's not part of what I'm going to get get deep into in this part. But you can see they have overhung hang, hung it some amount of distance. But the problem is the starter strip doesn't overhang equally. The starter strip appears to be held back flush to the edge metal. And so what happens now is when that overlay piece, that first full shingle lays down, that sealant strip is floating right out here, kind of out in the open air. So, oh, what a bummer. Like they almost had this one at least close enough to write that I wouldn't have known had they just brought that first shingle down to the same edge that they were gonna put their finished shingle to. Not only would that give a double thickness and extra strength there on the edge of the shingle, but it would give something for that upper shingle to seal to. So sometimes, again, here's an example where I've just lifted the entire shingles and there literally is no starter strip or any attempt whatsoever. You lift the shingle, you can lift the underlayment, you can see right inside the roof. And another example here where they've used a three tab shingle and the three tab shingles don't have the sealant on the bottom side of the lower exposed edge of shingle, they have it on the top side of the shingle below. And so that's where you, you need to pull that thing down and get it to, to have some sort of sealant strip. As you can see here, we don't have sealant strip on either side. And again, maybe a manufacturer is gonna come out and build their shingle a new way tomorrow. That's why we don't wanna just think about this stuff of like, well, the shingle is supposed to be installed exactly like this, this, and this, because I've read enough of these instructions. Get back to the root of it. The shingle shouldn't lift like this. And if it lifts like this, and maybe it's an unusual shingle, you're not, that might be the prompt to say, all right, what is this manufacturer asking for? Because this definitely isn't right. And then uh, just here's a, a, a little example talking about that uh, selvage film where the adhesive is not supposed to stick to it. You can see here a little bit of plastic wrapping from the shingle package that is keeping this shingle from sealing down. Obviously, this isn't a starter course, but I'm just, since I was talking about that subject, I'm bringing it up here. This is what happens, guys, when the pack of shingles gets shifted or slid a little bit. It's a plastic wrap around it. So sometimes these get manhandled a bit and thrown down, and you can get those different layers of shingles inside the package to kind of slip a little. And that's a bad idea. If the roofers leave a package like that sitting out there, the sun's gonna activate and often you get shingles stuck together. And in this case, once that package was sealed to this, it wasn't gonna factory seal down anymore. A quality professional installer doesn't necessarily, I mean, in my opinion, whatever, right? 
okay, throw the shingle away if you find it's ruined in the package. But if you've started laying it down and nailed it off or something and you find this, you know what? At least have the thought to come get the aesthetic garbage out from there, but go up in there and hand seal it the same way you would hand seal a mansard roof edge, right? I mean, oftentimes in roofing and in all kinds of construction, things don't go together picture perfect. We don't build this stuff in a, in a, in a closed environment in some laboratory. So the reality of installation is this kind of stuff happens um, and hand seal the shingles back down. All right, quick little drink. All right, next segment is about flashing. Again, that was just some of the stuff I sampled uh, from the shingle and underlayment section of my on-demand course. And now I'm gonna sample just some of the things about flashing. This is where I am gonna spend the majority, probably the rest of the class. At the end of this section on flashing, if I have a little time left, I do have a few other things to talk about, about valleys, just two little nuances that get missed. Uh, but let's see how much of flashing I can get through and if we can make it to that. So first of all, like I said, everything in the code is always pointing us to manufacturer's installation instructions, both for the installation of the shingles, but also for flashing for shingles. As you see here, flashing has to comply with the shingle manufacturer as well as the code. So obviously there's probably gonna be some examples for manufacturers in this segment. All right, so here's just a little character, little cartoon of a house and some asphalt roofing. And it says flashing in the code, this the code tells us flashing shall be installed at wall and roof intersections. So if we look at this, we have head wall flashing. That's what it's called out there in the field. Uh, the code often refers to this as vertical front wall flashing. Um, same thing when you see that in the code, it's talking about head wall flashing. That's what the roofer will call it. And so we'd have head wall flashing at the obvious location here where this roof comes up to a head wall. But in some ways, I would argue we also have a head wall flashing that's happening right here where this sloped portion of roof is intersecting the other, the other, generally the underside of the soffit or something else on this roof. And we'll see some examples of that. That's not usually referred to as the head wall flashing location. But when I show you these examples, well, maybe it should be. So, you know, we put some head wall flashing here and maybe some flashing up here to get that intersection into the soffit. And we get drip edge flashing in the IRC and in the manufacturer's instructions. And drip edge flashing is obviously at the bottom edge of all of these roofs where it is going to be dripping over the edge of the roof. But you also get drip edge flashing on the rake edges of the roof as well. And that drip edge has a different function that we'll talk about. And then another flashing that comes up is sidewall flashing. And that would be what I've shown here, where these sloped roofs going kind of into the page or into your screen are going to be adjacent and hitting the side wall there. That's at the side of the roof slope. Okay, so drip edge. Let's talk a little bit about drip edge flashing. Now, funny little bit of history. I think it was prior... Prior to the 2009 IRC, the IRC did not mention drip edge flashing. It was only the manufacturer's instructions that would drive the requirement for drip edge flashing. Um, so about 2009, I believe that's when it was, it was around that time uh, we got it included as well in the code. And I just like to bring that up because it, you know, roofs, asphalt shingles, these have been around a long time but we still can see evolution occurring in the codes with this. And trying to take some of those common things from manufacturer's instructions and go ahead and make them accessible right in the code. So looking at this example of just, you know, kind of a little cartoon of the side of a house here, we see shingles and water come flowing down like this. And water, uh, you know, water has a surface tension that wants to stick on things and adhere to things. Water, water likes to weep up things and get wicked up things. Water has some pretty interesting features to it. You know, I mean, water can hang off of a ceiling before it gets heavy enough to form a little drop and then break that surface tension. So as water would flow down this roof, some would certainly drop off the edge here, of course, in a big torrential rainstorm, but plenty of that moisture and water is going to roll over these edge of this shingle by its surface tension and kind of hang on up to this point. 
And then from that point, it'll it'll get heavy enough that it'll break that surface tension and you'll get water running down the face of your fascia like this. And of course, it's going to roll underneath the bottom of the fascia just a little bit as well and then break from that surface tension. But when this happens up here, when that water rolls under and it's kind of collecting until you get enough weight to break the surface tension, you know, water is also going wherever it wants to go. And so water will have a tendency to leak in this way and drain in behind that fascia. So drip edge comes along and gets placed like this. And the point of drip edge, drip edge we often refer to as a thing, a piece of flashing, a piece of metal flashing. But when you talk in terms of building science and, and physics, a drip edge isn't just a product you buy. A drip edge is a geometry, is a shape that breaks the surface tension of, a, um, of the water. So in this case, our drip edge flashing is providing a drip edge. And so as that water rolls underneath here like this and hangs out for a minute, it's not going to get past that metal flashing and then it's going to continue its way down. Typically, that drip edge will have a little kick out fold at the bottom. That would be ideal. And then it's going to break that surface temp tension. And the nice thing there is ideally we get a little bit of a drip coming down in front of the fascia. Minuscule, but I mean, because obviously rain's hitting the fascia and it's designed for water outside. But the main goal is here we're not getting water tucking in up and around the backside of the fascia. And then the next drip edge is a piece that would go on your rake like this. And I'm gonna use a different graphic to show this. Now this next graphic is not as well built out. So I'm just gonna give you some clues. We're gonna be looking at it from this direction and there's no fascia on this next graphic. So we can kind of see the layers of the roof a little bit better. So here you are looking at those rafter ends coming down and the gray soffit below. We're going to have that roof sheathing on top. Then you're going to lay your drip edge metal down underneath your underlayment and onto the roof sheathing. Then you'll put your underlayment down. And then we've got two layers of shingles, right? The starter course and then the next layer running up over there. Well, here's where we get into the purpose of drip edge for the sake of wind-driven rain and snow, wind-driven precipitation, rain being the, the worst of the two. Um, but snow definitely has a tendency and in poor installations to actually pack into these locations a little bit. But you'll get that wind-driven rain blowing at the shingles this way. And you've got an overhang of your shingles, sometimes an overhang of that underlayment. Um, but that would allow just rain and snow to drive in under those shingles and perhaps under the underlayment. And the underlayment is the final you know, water-resistive barrier for this roof. So your rake metal is going to go on top of the underlayment because its job is really more of, again, blocking uh, wind-driven rain. And so we get the statement in the code that, you know, I just showed you in pictures. Underlayment shall be installed over the drip edge along eaves and under the drip edge along rake edges. So you would want to put this drip edge on after you've put your underlayment and before you start placing shingles. And then we get this, uh, again, there's that statement just reminding you there, flashing for shingles in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. And like I said, drip edge started in the manufacturer's instructions before it even got into the code. Again, I think it was around 2009. And so here's a example from manufacturers where you see them referring to their, their trademarked uh, underlayment, but their underlayment goes over the drip edge at the eave and over here, you see it stating drip edge over their underlayment at the rake edge. So the code and the manufacturers right along, the, right on the same track. So here's now the photographic example of that, right? Here's the rake edge of a roof with some metal, uh, metal siding covering the fascia. It was probably a re-siding job or something where they came and put metal, metal cladding over the you know deteriorating wood fascia. And there's no edge metal here. There's So when you lift up the edge of these shingles, as you can see, I'm able to stick my finger completely inside and um, underneath the underlayment and as well in the little gaps in there from that fascia. So if my finger can get in there, wind-driven rain can definitely get in there. All right. 
So there's our drip edge at those bottom edges. But let's say the roof was designed a little different like this. I've come across roofs like this in my in my uh, career. And now we also still have an edge of a roof right here. Not so much what we would think of as a drip edge, but talking about the wind-driven rain scenario, wouldn't we also easily be driving rain pushing up against the underside of those shingles? And then when you look at the architecture of homes, this little part right here, usually that soffit that hangs out the side, if that wall is the same, if that's one plane right there, that would oftentimes extend up the side and we may end up with another need for drip edge in this application. So here's another example of a roof shingle replacement on an existing house, which again, you very similar, you know, an inspector for the government, code inspector looking at a roof shingle replacement. Boy, that's like as close to getting to what a home inspector's experience would be, at least in my thoughts, not having ever been a home inspector. Um, and so if we look here, notice this paint line. You know, I think there's some clues that something used to be here in the original construction when this house was originally painted that might have got forgotten when the roof was done. And uh, obviously, if we can see with our own eyes, OSB sheathing, nails, and we can see right inside the building, the building construction there, then probably water can get in there as well. So what was missing here is a piece of edge metal, a piece of drip edge or edge metal or flashing or whatever you want to call it that would go over the top of that, block the wind-driven rain, and then of course any rain coming down on top gets diverted as, by gravity onto the next shingle below. Can I go to the code and find exact words in a book to tell me this is required? No. Can I go to the manufacturer's installation instructions and find exact words in a book to tell me this is required? No. But as a government building inspector, I'm there as a third party to try to ensure not that words in a book somehow got read, but that the home actually has the performance that was intended. And so I encourage you professionals that same way. You know, sometimes you're going to make a call on things because you understand intent and purpose of construction, how construction is meant to perform. And I encourage you guys to be professionals in that in that respect and give that proper guidance to the clients that are looking to invest in a new property. Now, you guys don't need me to say that as much because that really literally is what you do. You aren't bound by codes or words or books. You are there at the buyers are looking for your professional discretionary advice. But I always have to tell inspectors that, that like, look, you are hired as a government inspector to, to serve your community, not because you know how to find words in a book, but because you understand construction. So for those of you that didn't feel empowered to look at things this way, based on your professional experience and knowledge, there's your empowerment. So this came up all the time. I have lots of pictures, but here's some nice, you know, better installations where they've gone and they've put this piece on here. And if we notice just, you know, I mentioned before about rain coming down, hitting that flashing and then getting diverted by gravity on top of the next layer, which would be shingles and then running down the roof. We did, I think in like 2012 IRC, somewhere around that time. I don't memorize all these things. I just, sometimes they get stuck in my brain, but this is a newer definition that came in the code again, probably around 2009, 2012 time. The code always referred to shingle fashion, just assuming folks knew what shingle fashion meant. But here we get a definition. And notice when you look at the definition, it's about installing roof and wall coverings, water resistant barriers and flashings or other building components, right? Other building components. We don't always have exact words in the book, but it tells us how the point is, is that we have overlapping layers. So to provide drainage will always go on top of the next level. This is what I call using physics to seal out a house. Physics is always your best choice. Physics, gravity, right? Wanting to pull things into place. Understanding surface tension of water and how sometimes water will go uphill when it's supposed to go downhill. That's understanding physics. Physics doesn't, get, doesn't break, doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't have a lifespan. Physics lasts forever. That's the first goal. If you can't get a roof sealed up with physics, the second option is chemistry. And that's 
sealants, right? Using caulk or sealant. So I always tell people, if you see a bunch of goop on a roof, someone probably did something wrong because most of our building designs rely heavily on physics. And when we absolutely can't do it with physics, we got to go with chemistry and go with a sealant. But again, sealants, chemistry like that, chemistry of materials, um, that doesn't last forever. Uh, all right. So here's an example where someone said, yes, of course I need drip edge at that top edge, but all they did was take the rake uh, edge metal and just wrapped it around the corner. So this hopefully is going on top of the underlayment, but it's not going on top of the shingles. And so you have all these exposed edges looking upward to the source of water where you can get moisture um, getting in between your layers of shingles here or on or underneath here and then on top of your underlayment. In this example, you can see, okay, here we go. They got the rake edge on top of the underlayment. Then they have their levels of shingles all the way up to the top. And then the final piece, right, shingle fashion, the, the top piece has that drip edge metal coming on top of the shingles. But hold on, Glenn, we see another shingle put over top. That's called a beauty strip. Some manufacturers have information about beauty strips and minimal nailing and then seal the heads of those nails. But beauty strips are generally there just as a bonus. I mean, exactly what the, the name says. Homeowners don't like to look at metal flashing on the roofs, especially the head wall flashing because you've got it coming down like four inches onto the roof surface. And if you got a roofer like this, boy, that head wall flashing really looks terrible, doesn't it? That's a ha ha we can laugh at of some of the things that we see out there. Of course, I could never touch the photos that you guys collect going out to all those existing homes. I love I love being active and following a lot of the uh, home inspector social media when I can wade through the one-upping each other and the ego chest pounding that I tend to find there and actually drill into just some of the amazing things people see where you realize that the general public has no respect for construction. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I'd, uh, I'm a homeowner. I'd probably want that covered with some beauty strips too. So we get a little information in the code about installing the drip edge. It has to be overlapped by not less than two inches onto its next one. Now, am I, I'm an inspector. I'm looking at this. I don't pull my tape measures out. Okay, some inspectors do. That's for them. That When it comes to government inspectors, there's generally two camps of folks, ones that wake up and say, how can I fail it? And ones that wake up and say, how can I approve it? Understanding intent and purpose. If I were to measure that and it was an inch and seven eighths, I'm going to put my tape measure away and I'm going to move on to better things to worry about. The code gives some guidance. You know, two inches is a pretty round number. If it was scientifically determined what this overlap would be, I'm guessing there'd be some significant digits or some fractions. So I always try to remember that when we have these beautiful whole numbers in the code that a little construction tolerance is expected. Um, so what about this one? This is inside an inside corner of a roof and it's two independent pieces. It's not one piece bent around that corner. Well, wouldn't that be adjacent segments and those segments are not overlapping? Now, truth be told, in my years as a building inspector, um, you know, I can't say that I got up on the ladder and was able to look at every single corner of every single drip edge location. I mean, you just, again, the, we, the idea should be the professional doing the work is the one that understands it. Uh, but nonetheless, where did this picture come from? This is actually my personal house. And, you know, you can learn a lot more about the failures of construction and things that don't work when you're not just seeing them in new construction all the time, like a, like a government building inspector would. So my own house, new roof, new gutters, new edge metal, and in big rainstorms, I was getting water dripping from this corner from behind the gutters. And the reason was that the edge metal did not overlap inside that inside corner. Um, and, you know, I can't complain to the roofer because it was me and my 12-year-old daughter that re-roofed our house many years ago. And so I learned my own lesson and then later came in here and bent and formed in a little piece. And once I put this in, lo and behold, that splashback from when the gutter, all that water coming down the valley uh, would no longer get up and down. And I finished, I fixed the little dripping problem. 
So there's a little personal shame story, but I have no shame. We learn through through our experiences and sometimes they're our own personal experiences, right? So what about this one I came to as an inspector? Well, it overlaps two inches, right? So it must be good to go. Well, you know, obviously we see what happens if we've got some water. Water has that surface tension. It's raining everywhere. Water rains blowing all over the place. It's a storm. We're going to have water that's going to be running still downhill, holding its surface tension on there and still kind of sliding down up inside that little gap. And we could see how that would possibly be able to get, you know, inside this edge metal. It's not it's not a very good installation, but I don't think we need words in a book to tell us that. Um, if we did want words in a book for this, I would really go back to that shingle fashion statement and notice it refers to flashing so that upper layers overlap lower layers to provide drainage. And so these words in a book are definitely trying to tell us that like, well, if you're going to do this, you might want to have done it in this direction, you know, despite the aesthetics of this. But again, as a government building inspector, I have had to pass the most ugly pieces of trash I have ever seen because quality is a consumer concern and building inspectors are not quality control for consumers. So if there's any consumers on this line, buyer beware, hire good quality contractors and cannot leave it all to the government. All right. So if we look here, that edge metal would go on like this. Oh, I was trying to remember what this next slide coming up is. Another thing we get in there is it says drip edges shall extend not less than a quarter inch below the roof sheathing, just a quarter inch. So that's not much. So if we look here, there's that roof sheathing most edge metal that you buy on the market that's per, per you know available for this application you're going to extend well below that quarter inch below the underside of the roof sheathing but this is the minimum code for your rake metal as well as you looked out here on your edge metal uh, on the on the eave part there or on the um yeah on the overhanging eave part there uh, and so this is, of course, assuming that the framer built it with the sheathing coming all the way down to the fascia. And so when we looked at that, you know, horrible looking picture that had two different sizes of edge metal and even worse, one was a D metal and one wasn't. Um, technically, by code, other than the overlapping issue, there's nothing. They're both above code because oops, because they both extend beyond the quarter inch, which is minimum. And then beyond that code has nothing to say. Now, as I said, quarter inch below the sheathing, but that's assuming your sheathing is coming down to the top of that fascia and you're actually able to wrap over your fascia a little bit. And if you were to have gutters, you know, they generally would be wise to put that gutter in behind the edge metal, uh, but gutter installations are not in code. So if we look here, we can see some really bad examples where, yeah, you're replacing this roof but you've got an existing situation where the, the, the framer was very sloppy and had the sheathing cut way back. Well, then you need to recognize that and do better, right, with that drip metal installation. It needs to come back up and over on top of your roof sheathing. So many examples of this where, again, the roofer is dealing with an existing situation of framing and maybe has the attitude of like, well, it's not my problem. But it is. It just means you have to purchase the appropriate material for the situation out on hand or at hand. So as we see in the code and manufacturers will say the same thing, it must extend up onto the roof deck, not less than two inches. So here we have brand new construction. We have that sheathing coming down all the way and we're going two inches up. And so your typical um, uh, drip edge metal here that can be purchased has plenty of of two inches coming up onto the roof deck. But here was an example where they bought a drip edge metal that had two inches. But if you look, two inches of drip edge metal wasn't enough to even get onto the um, roof deck at all. You can still see that huge gap right here leading into the roof deck. So it's no excuse for the roofers. They need to, they need to analyze the existing situation of the house that they're re-roofing. And if it had a sloppy framer, well, now you've got to be a better roofer. Another example there, you know, where again, that's edge metal that's installed below, but all the roofer did was put a thing in a place. There's one of my lines I always do when I'm teaching. I never know when it'll come up. Too often when we read the code, 
folks think of putting a thing in a place and then checking off the list because words in a book told them to. And that's the problem with simply reading words in a book and doing what you're told, but not actually understanding why. So here, a roofer might be mad that they failed inspection because they're like, I did it. I put the thing in the place. I bought the drip edge metal and I put it in the place that the words told me to. What's the problem? Well, you can see the problem in the photo, right? All right. Drip edges shall be mechanically fastened to the roof deck. Not, not less or not more, excuse me, not more. Yeah, I was like, thought I miswrote that. Not more than 12 inches on center. So we want to nail approximately every 12 inches. Hey, 12 inches. What is that? That's one foot. Like, boom. That's not a very accurate unit of measurement, is it? That's not, doesn't sound very scientifically derived. Like, it's convenient that we did all these wind tests. And it turned out that if, if we were 12 and a half inches, it would fail. But it's so odd. Right at one foot, it's perfect. Another time that I drive home that example that so often in the code, we end up picking a number that is a pretty convenient number and always remember to put a little reality behind it. So yeah, approximately 12 inches on center or one foot. What I'm more worried about is situations like this in the picture where the edge metal's fastened so sloppily that it's not even down on top of each other. And so it's lifting the shingles up and creating a poor final product and final performance. That's what I care about more than pulling my tape measure out and looking for fastening exactly 12 inches apart and not, not one eighth of an inch more or I'll fail the inspection. I already told you there's a camp of folks that wake up in the morning and that's their goal, that just find that one 12 and an eighth location. Don't be that inspector, either in home inspection or code inspection, please. So this, again, is what I'm looking for. Drip edge, that's just completely not connected at all. Obviously, we have a problem here. Now, here's a quick little fun story to just show you guys. Uh, you probably have heard of ice damming before, ice damming up on a roof over at these eave edges. Um, I do talk about ice damming in this my big class, but not in this presentation. Have you ever heard of window ice dams? This is a window ice dam. What happened here is you got ice damming at the top, but you also have very sloppy installations here of your edge metal and your underlayment. And so water is able to get up over that fascia and inside this soffit box. And then what happened is it was draining down the back side of the siding. And you can see, look at the corner of the window, the amount of water. There was literally water gushing out of the siding. You, all of this water was coming out of the siding and from the window. And then, of course, it's cold air out here blowing on it. And so it's refreezing. And this had literally just been building up layers of ice coming out from behind the siding. So very interesting, the connection of all of this. Nothing in construction is an island. Everything interconnects and touches everything else. I mean, hopefully these windows were well flashed, but... I happen to know this project and yeah, this project ended up getting a major, major uh, overhaul and some major um, construction liability lawsuit stuff going on as we can see in the photo. Um, so a little talk about head wall flashing. Boy, an hour goes really, really fast. I can't believe we're already down to the last five minutes. Okay, well, that's a bummer. I definitely did not get through where I was hoping to take you on this journey, but I should know better. I. I generally have a lot of things to talk about, but let's keep going and get as far as I can with this and I'll find a comfortable stopping point. It'll probably be a little bit after um, the hour, six o'clock hour, my time, whatever your time is. Um, I've already talked to um, InterNACHI about this and they said, I've got a little bit of time afterwards. I don't have to do a hard stop. So I prefer to do a comfortable stop to my classes. So I'm gonna keep going most likely after the hour uh, until I feel like I'm at an appropriate stopping point. I've been looking in the questions box and I don't see anyone having asked a question. Oh, there's some stuff in the in the chat. If you're going to ask me a question, please put it in the questions box because the chat 
you know, there's a lot of that's for you guys to chat. I'm just trying to glance. I don't like to get thrown off my groove. So I just glance for questions. Um, but I will answer if any questions come up. But uh, anyway, if you guys obviously maybe this is all you wanted was one hour and you get your credits and you roll. Thanks so much for attending with me today. I hope you got something out of this hour. Um, for the rest of you that want to stick around, I'm going to roll through until I get to a comfortable stopping point. Hey, Glenn, okay. we do have one question from Joseph Smith. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, he says, for a house built in 2000 that did not originally have a drip edge flashing installed, when that roof covering is replaced, would it need to be, would it need to have a drip edge installed correct? Yes. Great question. And so, so, okay, so I like this. So. I don't answer questions simply. Some people that drives them crazy, but I don't care. That's my style because I like to be very thorough. So, and since we're, I may be talking to a mixed audience. So the first thing I like to see is it says, would it need to have a drip edge installed? So the first question would be, who is determining what that need is, right? So is it a need because the building department through a governmental third party review and oversight of a construction project won't pass inspection unless it ha unless it has drip edge that kind of need but what if you know i always tell people when i'm teaching code there's a lot of jurisdictions in the united states that have not chosen to reference a model code and adopt it in their local ordinance in order to regulate construction in their local community in those cases the code is an excellent book with the latest modern knowledge about construction standards that's been created through this consensus process through the ICC where all ideas are welcome, everything's transparent, everything's free, everything's visible. What a great guidebook, even if you don't have a code and it's just a homeowner doing their own roof and there's no permits or anything required. But then another need might be like a home inspector and what advice would you guys be giving or recommending to your future buyer? So I always just like to, to state it like that so we're, we're clear. So the answers. A new roof installation is new roof shingling. You are allowed to reuse existing flashing if it's not deteriorated or corroded and it still works. It still serves the same function. I have some examples that don't work, but we didn't get to that part of this class. So you can reuse existing flashing, just something to think about. Um, but then otherwise, you are still responsible. And this is how generally building code people, government code inspectors would interpret it is that you are still responsible for creating the joint between your new roof shingles and everything else those shingles interconnect with, be that head wall, be that side wall, be that drip, ed be that connecting to the fascia at that drip edge or the fascia at the rake edge. The roofer would want to complete the joint to the material. Sometimes you have really deteriorated siding, like at these head wall locations. And I've seen roofers that are like, look, I didn't get paid to replace the siding but I still have to make the joint to it. And that bottom edge of siding you see is just falling apart and deteriorated and they will add additional metal on the wall. Looks terrible, but they're, I would say they're doing the professional job. Like, look, this isn't bid for me to replace all the siding in this house. They need to do that as another project, but I need to connect this joint to this trashed material. So when I was a building inspector, that's how I interpret it, and that's how I teach it to other building inspectors. Now, as far as home inspectors offering guidance to somebody on the purchase of their home, or maybe you're doing uh, you're su doing support, like a lot of home inspectors provide supportive services to homeowners that are having projects done by contractors, where you're kind of you're kind of a, a quality control inspector during the construction process. I would certainly say that the best guidance to give your clients is that they need to put on the drip edge metal. The manufacturer of the shingle wants that there. They know that's what's gonna create a good joint between your shingle and the siding. Um, and if it leaks there, you know who's gonna get complained to. Oh my gosh, I got a new roof. And ever since the new roof, it's, it's leaking into my house. So as I said, I don't answer things simply and easily. And that's also not a definitive kind of question. It's very much a human opinionated question. Um, so there's there's my rambling on that. And OK. All right. So let's uh, wrap through a little bit more through this. And I may sneak in. I have a story I wanted to tell at the end where someone called me and said their sighting was crying. And uh, I'll see if I, I'll try to at least get 
get to telling that story. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting little story that I have photos of. Um, so anyway, other vertical flashing, other flashing, vertical front wall flashing. We call this head wall flashing. And then you can see, again, here's a head wall flashing example with those beauty strips that are put on as well to cover that head wall flashing. Here's a different example of beauty strips installed with nails. And then you can see chemistry, right? That, that final location where there's just no way to get this top layer down. Maybe you could glue the whole thing down. There's not a lot of definitive standards on how these beauty strips get put on. I always just try to look at it through the eyes of the homeowner. They, I understand why homeowners want their houses to look attractive and don't want big shiny pieces of metal. And I always try to balance code and perfection with also, you know, what do, what do the American people want? You know, because what they desire and like in, the, in their looks in their homes, it does matter. So if we can accommodate that, let's accommodate it. But if you look at this example of this beauty strip, well, hold on a minute, I'm lifting under the corner of that and I don't see head wall flashing. So this is where, whoops, something went wrong. That head wall flashing was put under all the shingles. Should have been put on top of this last shingle we can see here. And then the beauty strip just placed on top of that. So head wall flashing against a chimney. And these are all, all this is always a very tricky subject. This comes up in this presentation under sidewall, but you'll have to take the free on-demand class if you want that stuff. Uh, here's the part I wanted to talk about where we, where head wall flashing, we don't always think about head wall flashing is in these spots right here where we have this roof in the lower part of the picture is going uphill. And so that would be a head wall at the top over here in the right side of the photo would be where we would have head wall flashing. But what about here where it intersects this fascia? Okay, well, hey, look, there's birds under there. This is a place I see birds nesting all the time. And if birds are able to get underneath here and start nesting, well, first of all, that's maybe not a water precipitation issue, but I don't think homeowners want houses designed with beautiful little spots for birds to nest literally inside the cavities of their home. So here's a place where flashing might have a purpose for more about pest intrusion. Here's another example of birds getting under there. But oftentimes too, installers will just shove the shingles underneath there with nothing on that top edge. And again, rain and wind driven rain and snow can get pushed and shoved into that area, ultimately to, to melt or to drain down and get underneath the shingles. So these are areas where some metal flashing is very useful. You can see, you can see here, this whole roof coming up to these head walls would have flashing but what about right in that spot right there? And if I look inside there, I can actually see an untreated edge of the soffit material right here. And you can see some, you know, this is just standing from the ground taking a photo. So this is where it would probably be smart for some installers. I don't know if you call it head wall flashing or what you would call it, but to come in here and put in some, um, some type of flashing, again, either for wind driven rain and snow or simply to keep out pests. Okay, so I am going to, this next part was gonna jump into a big part about step flashing. Um, I am going to skip this and I'm gonna move to that story that I wanted to talk about. So give me just one second to go through. Oh, there was some great stuff to show you here. I never do good with, with my timing. I should just know better, a 60 minute webinar, boy, that just goes like this for me. All right, so here's the little story. I'm going to wrap up this webinar with this little roof leak story. If you guys uh, had any other questions, feel free to plop them into the Q&A. But otherwise, I'll run through this story, maybe like five minutes or so, and uh, we'll call that a session. You guys can always reach out to me if you have questions. As you can tell, I really love what I do. I love this subject. Um, I will do my best to communicate with you on email, maybe answer some questions. But remember, I am self-employed and independent. You guys probably all understand how that is. Uh, our time, we have to be careful with how we can allot it. Uh, but my email is glenn, G-L-E-N-N, -N, at buildingcodecollege.com. Uh, and that should come up on the ending slide here in a minute. So let's tell this story. So I actually wrote an article about this story in the JLC like well over 10 years ago. It was called The Case of the, Sob the Sobbing Sighting. If you Google The Case of the Sobbing Sighting, you'll, you'll find probably that article. JLC and Fine Home Building, who I've been writing for for well over a decade, coming up on two decades here soon enough. Um, 
most of all those articles are available online for free up to a certain amount, uh, unless you have a subscription. All right, so here's the roof leak story. I was the building inspector doing tons of roof inspections on roof replacements and building division gave this thing a past inspection in the records, put in the records, moved on, and I'm working my work, okay? We get a huge rainstorm that comes through our city, tons of rain, and I get a phone call from a homeowner that's transferred over to me because they're very upset that their house is doing something very weird. And they look up and say, well, Glenn passed that inspection, so let me transfer you to Glenn. So, well, Glenn got the question. And the people are like, my siding is crying. There is literally water dripping out between my siding. This was not happening until after my roof was replaced. And you, idiot inspector, passed the inspection. Well, you know, again, my city and myself as a government inspector, I believe that my role is as a community servant. I am there to serve the community. And so, of course, I told them, well, tough crap. I passed the inspection. I did my job. Go pound sand. And there's my story. No, I'm kidding. So obviously, I'm, I'm concerned. I have a concerned citizen, and they're looking at us to help make sure that their contractors are doing things well. So I called the contractor and said, hey, can we meet out on this house? Um, and let's take a look at what's going on here together and see if we can figure this out. So sure enough, we show up and um, as you're coming up to the front of the house, there's the side wall and the garage right there. And other side of this is the garage. And yeah, sure enough, there's these water stains all down the side of this wall. And if you look at the angle, you can see these water stains. This isn't like drip edge. This isn't like water from up top rolling over that edge. If you look, it's literally coming out from between the little cracks in the paint lines right there. You know, when they paint this stuff, that's just lap siding, so it's not sealed, but the paint kind of kind of laps over, but there's little bubbles and holes in the paint. And you can see that's where the water is coming out. So yeah, sure enough, the siding was crying. So I'm intrigued. And so I go into the other side of this wall and it's the garage. And you can see here, they've got these high heel trusses, energy trusses as often called. There's your double top plate. Here's that black Celotex. Um, fiberboard sheathing on the side of that wall, and it's running up on the edge of those high heel trusses. And there was a bit of a gap up inside there. You can see that two by four top cord of the truss leave, left about a three and a half inch gap. Now I couldn't get my big head up in there, but what I did is I took my phone and stuck it down inside that gap and took some photos. And one of the photos was this. This is looking right down the back side. So that to the left of the photo is the vertical um, black Celotex fiberboard. Here's that piece of wood, that's the nailer. And then you can see the soffit that has the water stains. That's the soffit material that's horizontal on the underside of the eave. And so just below these water stains in this corner is where the lap siding would begin. And so, okay, obvious clue. There's some water stains coming in here and then getting behind that siding. So then I got my phone and looked up. If you look up, like up this page to the top of this page uh, or this photo, you could then, I got another picture looking this way. And what we had was an eave on this wall intersecting another roof line coming down. And if you look right here, you can see this water stain where my mouse pointer is going, all this water stain. And look at all the granulars from the shingles that have been run in there. And remember when I talked about, this is where I talked about birds nesting and how sometimes the shingles just kind of get shoved under there. You can see here where the shingles are just shoved under and you can see this exposed roof deck. All right, now this isn't actually the house. This is the one photo, the, the, one of the photos I forgot to get, but this is looking at this house and imagine, that, or looking at an example of this condition, imagine this little short gutter continued off the left of the house and that roof was just coming down. But what is accurate is right here. This is where that picture was taken, where if, if this was the same house, I'd be on the back side of that wall, taking a picture and looking inside that eave. And then the other photo I showed you would have been looking this direction up there. Okay, now going back to the actual house where the leak occurred, they had the gutter coming in there. Like this picture, let me, hold on, let me, I didn't take this picture right, so I'm gonna adjust it. So this is kind of what we're looking at right now. Here's the slope, right, where water is gonna come sloping down here. And then you can see the metal gutter and they just cut the, the end of the metal gutter open. So that upper roof, the gutter would just flow and drop it onto the lower roof. 
And can you see what happened? That same spot I was talking about before where we where the birds' nests were, basically, and you can see some of that water was able to get under here. Here is that last piece of metal step flashing. And then they were that water was able to get underneath here and inside that soffit. And that's where it connects to here and then would run down here and then got behind the siding. And what was the fix? One little tiny piece of sheet metal. It was one piece of step flashing short to just come down with an extra little piece of step flashing in there, block up that hole, get it underneath the other shingle. You know, it's not perfect. This should probably look corner. We could pick this apart, right? The little bent corner. But now again, now when you look at that, now you can see that added metal and we blocked the hole. And just a fun story, I'll, I'll probably share the rest of my career to show just how interesting this all works, right? Someone says their siding is crying and it ends up being something interrelated to gutters and drainage. And then what was the fix? One little piece of step flashing that got missed. So uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'm sorry I couldn't talk faster or shorter, or get everything, or maybe just plan better what I wanted to get in. But I, again, I hope you guys got something out of it. And of course, you know, the consolation prize, you can use that coupon code asphalt in all lowercase and get access to the on-demand version of this for free. And all these little segments are just videos that are recorded. You do not have to step through. If you don't want the CEUs for the course and you just want to check out the videos, you can just hop in and watch the videos there. Uh, my name is Glenn Matthewson. Thanks so much for learning with me today. And there is my email there. Have a great rest of your afternoon.